beginning our webinar on electoral issues. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Keep Our Republic and the University of Dayton School of Law. My name is Dan Friesen, and I will be the moderator today. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody from around the country. We have an emphasis on media representatives, um, and we do have them from all over the country, as well as other interested folks. A couple of housekeeping matters first. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. So if you would like to, uh, if you enjoy it and would like to forward it to your friends, that's one of the options. There is also a, a written paper that goes with this webinar that deals with many of the issues that are coming up. Um, and uh, we have uh, provided a link to that paper and we'll send a link reminding everyone uh, of how they can access that paper. Uh, this is for the media and many of our uh, reporters asked us if this could be for attribution and the answer is yes. Uh, so our comments here are for attribution with the exception that any questions that are asked will not be attributed to the people who ask those questions. Uh, so uh, feel free to exercise your First Amendment rights without any chilling effects. Um, the, speaking of questions, you can, there's a Q&A function in this webinar and we'll be collecting those and forwarding those to the panel. Um, hopefully people will feel free to ask questions as we go and we'll filter those and, and present them to the panelists, but we'll also try and save some time at the end to ask some questions. Uh, with those housekeeping matters taken care of, let me introduce myself a little bit more and our panelists. And then I'm gonna start with a, um, a doomsday hypothetical. So let me start by telling you who I am. My name is Dan Friesen. I am a lawyer in Colorado, uh, a litigator for some 30 years, litigating First Amendment and civil rights issues. Uh, I was with a, a large firm for many years and then had my own firm. We also have uh, with us, uh, Senator Gary Hart. Uh, Mr. Hart represented the state of Colorado in the United States Senate from 1975 to 1987. In 84 and 88, he was his party's nom uh, nominee for president of the United States. Uh, before retiring from public service, he was co-chair of the U.S. Commission on National Security. He was the chair of the U.S. Department of State International Security Advisory Board, the chair of the U.S. Department of Defense Commission on Threat Reduction, and a U.S. envoy to Northern Ireland. He holds graduate degrees from Yale University and Oxford University, and we are very pleased to have him. Welcome, Senator. I, 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 Gary, you're on mute. I think you're on mute for, for that, Senator. I, I correct your, your kind introduction. I was not the nominee of the Democratic Party, alas. I, ap I apologize. Uh, you were the candidate for the, for the presidency of the United States. Correct. Um, uh, we also have with us uh, Mary McCord. Uh, Mary served as an acting assistant attorney general for national security at the US Department of Justice from 2016 to 17 and a principal deputy assistant attorney general for the National Security Division from 2014 to 2017. Currently, she serves as a legal director at the Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection and a visiting professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. Welcome, Mary. Thank you for having me. Having me. We also have Mark Medish. Mark served as a special assistant to the president, senior director on the National Security Council and as a deputy assistant secretary of the US Treasury in the Clinton administration. He worked on foreign assistance at the State Department and the UN Development Program. He was a partner at Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld. He's the Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and President of a division of Guggenheim Partners. Currently, he is the President of the Messina Group, a strategic consultancy. He is the co-founder of Keep Our Republic one of our co-sponsors today. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Great to be with you. The, um, so with those introductions and with this powerhouse panel, uh, I wanted to uh, start with a hypothetical. This hypothetical has been making its rounds for the last actually more than a year. Uh, and it was published this morning in the New York Times or a piece of it. So 
I think it's particularly timely. And uh, it is designed to highlight the consequences of too much uncertainty and chaos in the election process. So it goes something like this. And as you'll see, some of the, some of the components of it um, uh, might not be entirely hypothetical. Let's say in the state of Pennsylvania, there's a ongoing dispute about mail-in ballots. There are multiple examples of internet misinformation and violence at the polling places that makes voting virtually impossible. People are afraid to turn out. Uh, media outlets on both sides, both the left and the right, allege that the other side is trying to steal the election. Public protests continue for weeks after the election. As the deadline for certifying votes nears, that is certifying votes to the Electoral College, litigation is still pending, hundreds of lawyers enjoying full employment. Uh, the Democratic governor certifies the election for Biden because he is the only he is ahead in the only count that exists as of the deadline for certification. The Republican state legislature claims that no count is possible at all because of all the irregularities in the election and the violence. It relies on the US Constitution that says that the legislatures pick the electors and on the Supreme Court of the United States decision in Bush versus Gore, which declared that the legislature's power is plenary and it can take it back at any time. And it says it's in charge of declaring the electors and it certifies Pennsylvania's electors for Trump. Now, we've got conflicting certifications from the state of Pennsylvania. The, ele the electoral votes are presented to Congress, to the House and the Senate on January 6th of 2021 for counting. Uh, they count them and uh, Trump has 260 votes and Biden has 258 votes without counting Pennsylvania. The 20 votes for Pennsylvania are in dispute. The Senate says they should be certified for Trump under the state certification. And uh, the House says they should be certified for Biden under the uh, governor's certification of those votes. So uh, Trump claims victory because he has the majority of the electors. Uh, on which both houses agree. That is, if you take the total number of electors certified, uh, that is only 518, the 538 electors, bear with me on the math here, 538 electors, and you subtract the 20 electors from Pennsylvania, you're left with 518. So Trump claims he has a majority of the 518 because he has 268, or sorry, 250, 260 electors. So he claims a majority. Uh, he says, alternatively, if it takes 270 electors to win, then um, neither Biden nor Trump has the 270 electors needed, and the election is decided in the House of Representatives under the contingent election procedure in the 12th Amendment. As we go to the House, uh, the election is decided by delegations, not by a raw number of votes in the House. So Montana would have the same number of votes, one, as California, one, and New York, one. So in that vote, uh, Trump prevails. So Trump claims victory either having a majority of the reduced number of electors, not counting, counting Pennsylvania, or if it goes to the House, that's where he'll win. So, that's the hypothetical we're in, and let me let me stop there and um, ask our panel first: Could this happen? Is, is this a, a, a is this even possible? Because we don't want to spend too long tilting at windmills. Mary, what do you think? Well, I mean, it's possible. I think it is not probable. Um, that's a whole lot of things would have to go drastically wrong from the very beginning, including uh, a, you know, the possibility even of a failed election. Um, I think this hypothetical is you know, great. This is a great like uh, law review, um, uh, law school exam for an election law class, I think, because it, it poses almost every complication. Um, I, one thing that, 
uh, the very beginning of the hypo brought to mind, though, that I think many people haven't talked about is 3 USC 2, that's Title Three of the US Code Section 2, which actually says whenever, it's one sentence long, whenever any state has held an election for the purposes of choosing electors and has failed to make a choice on the day prescribed by law, the electors may be appointed on a subsequent day in such a manner as the legislature of the state might direct. Now, your hypo started with examples of internet misinformation and violence that made voting virtually impossible. So I would say that that would lead to a question about whether it was a failed election and I, um, in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania on that day. I think the, in, and that's, an, that's unclear under the law. Um, the, I think most of us understand that the intent of that statute was for things like natural disasters, mass power outages, something that literally meant the vote could not go forth, as opposed to this hypo that suggests that it was more difficult for people to vote, or maybe some people were intimidated from voting, but there was a vote that took place. So I think that one of the first possible bits of litigation you might have would be over uh, whether this was a failed election before, before you ever get to the Electoral Count Act. Well, I don't think a cyber attack or a riot would be that different than an earthquake in terms of its effect on voting, or or maybe a pandemic could have a, a parallel effect as, a, as an earthquake. I think if you're talking about a cyber attack that meant nobody, that none of the votes could be registered, I think you're exactly right. I guess I took it to be that there were some voting, maybe I misunderstood the hypothetical, that there was some voting that took place, but just not nearly as much as would have been expected. But I think these are all the unanswerable, unanswered questions, right? And so it's possible that the legislature would say, the Republican controlled legislature, we get, it, we get to do something completely different now because we have a failed vote and we wouldn't even get to like the next couple of paragraphs of your, of your <laughs> lengthy hypothetical. Well, I, it's a hypothetical, so I get to change it however I want. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, Mark, Mark, what do you think? Do you think it's possible something like this could happen? Sure, I mean, I think it's possible, but as Mary said, um, unlikely. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we couldn't end up there. Uh, things like it have happened before in 1876. There was the potential for it in 2000 if the election dispute uh, between the Bush and Gore campaigns had continued. Um, so it is possible. And as both of you suggested, one of the challenges is that it's relatively uncharted territory legally. There are some guidelines, some provisions in uh, federal statutes and in the Constitution that we can point to uh, to give guidance for this type of disputed election situation or a contingent election in the House, as you were discussing. But there's also ambiguity in those laws, even some contradictions. And so different sides could make colorable arguments. Uh, one argument could be over what you brought up, Dan, which was what, what is a majority? Is it, is it the 270 or if a state is out of commission does the denominator change? That's actually not, that's a case of first impression, I think. Um, uh, and you could have arguments on either side. The Constitution actually has two somewhat rival provisions. One says that states shall, it makes it sound like every state sh shall put forward electors, but there's another one that says a majority of those appointed, I think is the word. Right. In the 12th Amendment. So there's a contradiction already there. It's that wiggle room that that creates uncertainty and, and suspense. The structure of it, I think, is very much as you outlined, and it, it's important to be clear on it. Normally, the popular vote translates into the electoral vote, and we have a result. There's a possibility that the electoral vote is inconclusive, and the electoral college could deadlock in a number of ways. There could be a tie. There could be a 269-269 tie, as one example, or there could be a problem because of the types of disputes you just described in your hypothetical. If the Electoral College is inconclusive, then the 12th Amendment kicks in and we have what's called a contingent election in the House. A key point there, however, is that it's the new House, not the current House that votes. So we don't really know. At current, and it is, as you said, by state delegation. So it's not the, the seats of the House, it's it's who has a majority in each delegation state by state. So if party discipline holds, which is another assumption, 
you know that that's the question currently the um currently the uh republicans hold a majority i think 26 delegations are majority republican there are two that are evenly divided and the democrats have 22. that could change in the new house number one number two whether party discipline holds is an open question uh, in a, in, it depends on what the nature of the dispute is, probably, you know, uh, how ugly the battle has become. So those are just a few initial observations, but I would underscore, I think everyone speaking here today hopes that nothing like this comes to pass and hopes that we can have an orderly American apple pie election. Um, well, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I echo your, your hope. Um, let, me, let me push you a little bit and, and turn this towards what might happen in the Senate. So I think you said that there's a colorable argument that a state legislature could take over if, if, under certain circumstances, if they were extreme enough. And you're not saying the argument would win. I think you're saying it's, it's a colorable argument. And, and so here's, here's how the hypothetical, I, I think, was, was meant to go and, and what a lot of people have, right. have used this example to illustrate. Right. And that is uh, the votes are counted in the House and the Senate on January 6th. And there is a colorable argument that the votes from Pennsylvania should be counted in favor of Trump yeah. uh, in, in my hypothetical. And so the Senate says, well, if we have the power to count these votes for Trump, that's what we do. I mean, we had this similar arguments when the Senate said we have the power to nominate and approve a Supreme Court justice. So that's what we're going to do. We have the power not to call witnesses during impeachment, so we're not going to call witnesses during impeachment. If we have the power to do something, we were elected by the people to exercise that power, so we're going to pick Trump. Right. So, right. so let me, uh, Senator Hart, turn turn to you. It, is is the Senate a body that um, is constrained by by the laws, or is a colorable an argument enough? Well, first of all, let me um, repeat the observation that Mark has made with regard to the hypothetical calendar, if I got it straight. If the vote that you're hypothesizing occurs on the 6th of January, you're not dealing with the current House or the current Senate. You're dealing with the new Congress. No one knows what that Congress is going to look like, although pundits, perhaps some of whom are participating here today, uh, have hypothesized that the House stays in democratic control, but with a different makeup uh, of, of numbers of states that are going to vote unilaterally, the Senate, could turn to the Democratic Party. We don't know that, but that's going to be something to watch. But the makeup of both of those houses are going to, is going to be critical. And that house, that Congress is sworn in, if I remember correctly, on the 3rd of January. So that's three, right. days, three days later, you've got the situation which you, your hypothetical contemplated. As to what the Senate is going to do, much would the answer to that is, it depends on what it looks like. The Senate today, unfortunately, is, um, if I may say so, is not the same Senate I served in, which was much more congenial, much, much more willing to adopt bipartisan stances. Uh, the full force of um, gerrymandering and polarization of the parties had not been felt in the Senate of the 70s, began to change in the Reagan years in the 80s, and ultimately came to where we are today, where votes are occurring, on, including on Supreme Court justices, on straight party lines. So it's very hard for me or anyone else to say, what would the Senate do? <laughs> because first of all, it's a, it's a totally different institution than when I was there. 
and under Mr. McConnell is um, quite willing to make up rules as it goes along, which would never have occurred under Majority Leader Mike Mansfield in my days. Well, I think, I think every, sorry, go ahead, Mary. Well, Dan, I was just gonna push back a little bit on this hypo about the Senate even being in a position to just say that the, that the slate of the, the legislature, the Republican legislature in Pennsylvania put out would, would carry the day because the way this works is that if there are um, two different slates of electors put forward by one state, the Congress in joint session tries to, well, they actually split apart if they can't agree. They first meet in joint session, as we indicated on January 6th, to count the electors. And typically they would look at, did one of these slates of electors meet what's called the safe harbor date under, under federal law? That's part of the Electoral Count Act. That safe, safe harbor date is December the 8th. And what that safe harbor date means is that if under state law, there is a means of certifying a slate of electors and they do so by that state harbor date under uh, safe harbor date under state law then that's the slate that should be should be counted uh, by congress on january 6th regardless if somebody else is saying there's some other slate if they don't meet that safe harbor date typically the uh, the congress should look to whether um the governor actually of the state certified it because there's at least at least some scholars interpret it the uh, Electoral Count Act to sort of put a tiebreaker to the governor. And in fact, there is no real authority in a state for a, the legislature to sort of override the will of what the vote is. And we should say that also to begin with. If there's no, no agreement, so let's assume the Senate is saying, well, we still should accept the we should accept what the Republican legislature from Virginia, from Virginia, from Pennsylvania put forward, and and the House is saying we should accept what the governor put forward. Um, if they can't reach, you know, the Senate just doesn't get to win that, right? If they can't agree by January 11th, then we have an, a failure to agree, and then this 20th Amendment kicks in, in which case. It would be the House, not the Senate, as you've indicated already, who would decide on the on the next president. Now, obviously, your hypothetical included that uh, 26 states, because it's one vote per state, um, ha are Republican controlled, and therefore, you could probably come up with the same result that you were suggesting anyway that Trump wins. But I think there would be a different, potentially a different way to get there. Um, and of course, if that still can't be resolved and isn't resolved because things are tied up in litigation, on January 20th, by the Constitution, there's got to be, uh, you know, a, a president installed. And if and if the the winner is tied up in litigation and is uncertain, that would be an acting president who would be installed, and that goes first to the Speaker of the House. Mark, your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, if I I could just amplify a little bit. Uh, on, on what Mary said. So this idea of dueling slates, very important. That That's the scenario you're really getting at, Dan. And the safe harbor provision that Mary highlighted is the one to keep in mind. That comes from the Electoral Count Act of 1887. Uh, and it was an attempt to bring order uh, to the situation of, of conflicting slates. The problem with the statute is it's very poorly written, as, as Mary mentioned. It's like a crime of syntax. I defy anyone to sit in. It's very short. It's relatively short, but opaque. It actually has a provision that gives the gov a governor, an executive, the tie-breaking role, privilege. So that cuts in one direction. But on the other hand, it affirmatively contemplates competing slates of electors going forward. Uh, so, you know, a legislature could say, well, wait a second, we, you know, we're there, we're still in, in play. And as you said, in Bush v. Gore, there was reference to the plenary uh, authority of a legislature. So that's what sets up the possibility for dueling slates. I think it's important to bear that in mind. Um, when it comes to the Senate and the House, keep in mind there are quorum rules in the 12th Amendment that have never really been tested. But the Senate requires a two-thirds quorum in order to act in the way you were outlining. And, and that quorum could be denied. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. So what I'm trying to highlight here is there's, an, there's a dimension of parliamentary procedure that becomes very important and, and potent, potentially, as the dispute unfolds, hypothetically. 
And if you look at the, our election calendar, as you move from November 3rd into January, it's always a mix of law and politics, but it becomes less sort of pure legal theory and more political as you move forward into January. Once it's in Congress, it really is a question of political uh, maneuvers and parliamentary maneuvers, and we shouldn't underestimate that. So that the that notion, this goes to the question, could the Supreme Court come in and decide this? Well, yes, at certain points, perhaps. That was the case in Bush v. Gore. But remember that Gore chose to accept the Supreme Court ruling. Nothing required him to do that. He could, as a, as a legitimate political contender, he could have continued to dispute the election and taken it into Congress. So just- Yeah, no, those are- points. Those are all critical points. And I, I, I like your observation that the further into the process it goes, the more political it becomes. I, I, I think that uh, it is the new Congress and my, my hypothetical assumes that the Senate would retain, that the Republicans would retain power of the Senate and that the mixture of state delegations would remain uh, Republican leaning. Um, it, because if, if either of those th two things didn't happen, then as the politics evolved, it, a lot of this would become moot. I, I think those are excellent points. Um, and, and I also appreciate very much, uh, uh, Mark and Mary, the point about the tie break. And uh, there is a, a law, and, and I think for all the, the journalists on the line, uh, there, there is law on how to resolve these kinds of disputes. And that is the certification by the governor done by the deadline based on pre-existing law uh, in a state where they have a full and final process for resolving election disputes is the one that controls. The thing that worries me is that there are scholars on both sides of this question, including the Congressional Research Service, that say that that tie break is not controlling uh, in the Senate unless it is given pursuant to the state's law. So there is a, a loophole, if you will, for the Senate to say, or the House, either one to say, no, we're not gonna follow the count that's been certified to us by either the governor or the state legislature. They, they could frankly pick either one because we don't think that you followed your own state law. For example, you counted ballots after your own midnight deadline. And sure, maybe you had a good reason to do it, but you broke your own state laws in doing it. So we're not gonna count your votes. Um, so I guess as this process moves from legal to political, that's the hypothetical I'm pushing, that, that if you got to a place where the Senate, the new Senate, you know, still controlled by Republicans, was saying we count the votes one way, uh, and the and the either Trump wins here, either Trump wins in this count, or we kick this to the House of Representatives under a contingent election and Trump's gonna win there. I guess I'm wondering politically if the Senate would do that. I know that's very speculative. And, and also what effect public opinion and the American people and the media, how that would all play into the mix. And, and, and Senator Hart, I, 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 you have such a broad perspective on this. I, I know the hypothetical might be getting stretched too thin, but, but can you indulge me a little bit? And, and, and if we had that kind of a constitutional crisis, where the Republicans seem to be saying, no, we have the power to, 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 to elect Trump and we're gonna do it. And this is no longer a matter of the popular vote. What, what do you think would happen? There would be um, major public unrest in the streets all across the country, but particularly in the capital of the state that in effect violates the will of its own voters the price would be paid one way or the other. Uh, I, I think the fact that now almost 70 million votes have been cast makes this um, a high, what I would call a high alert election. People are, people on both sides are revved up and, and in many cases nervous. So if, if a state maneuver back to the political, pure politics to tilt the election to 
uh, to a candidate that did not carry the votes of that state, a uh, price would be paid. And governors would be impeached, state legislatures would be brought into court. Um, I, th I think the press itself would have a heyday with this, obviously. It, it would be a turning point for this nation and serious undermining of the principles of democracy. Well, I wonder how a deadlock uh, in the House and Senate about how to count the votes, you know, and I, there is, a, the Electoral Count Act does provide a tie break, but let's, let's assume for my hypothetical, because it's my hypothetical and I get to, get to, to, get to make assumptions. Um, let's assume that the, that the tie break um, is not honored because the one House or the Senate says it was not lawfully given, that it was impossible to count the votes in that state. Um, then you're in we court. Really have, we were, go ahead. You're in court. Then so, you're in so Which court? Which court? Will we go to the Supreme yeah. Court? Um, I, <laughs> I defer to my colleagues on this, particularly Mary, but um, it's one of two things. It either is federal district court in the capital of that state, or it's a, search, it's a writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States I, on an emergency basis. I think that's exactly right. I think there's a couple of problems. One is separation of powers because the, the Supreme Court doesn't have a whole lot of power to order Congress around. And, and um, the second is the legislative history of the Electoral Count Act Back in 1876, they tried to resolve the Tilden Hayes election by appointing a panel, which included Supreme Court justices, and the Congress was very unhappy with the way that came out. And so when they passed the Electoral Count Act, they didn't intend to give the Supreme Court power to uh, resolve disputes in the Senate about how to count votes. And so it may be that the Senate just says, okay, well, the Supreme Court doesn't even have jurisdiction. We're going to count these votes under any color of law that we see, see appropriate, and we're certifying Trump's electors because we think those are most accurate. And the, the right-leaning media takes up that cause and says, this is the right way to do it according to US law and the US Constitution. Um, what happens? Well, obviously the court which has jurisdiction, either the federal district court, the court of appeals or the Supreme Court, will presumably rule on the process. And the process that delivered this result will be determined by that court to have been lawful or not, constitutional or not. It, it, I, I doubt a court, a single judge, a panel, of appellate judges or the Supreme Court would say uh, by a vote of six to three, we want Donald Trump as president. I don't, they're, they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to write a different opinion. <laughs> they have to have more, more legal veneer than that. Precisely. Well, a further complication, oh, sorry. A further complication is that, you know, basically as Senator Hart can tell us, uh, the House and the Senate really are empowered to make their own rules. And it's it one body may have standing to sue the other because of a disagreement about how the rules were arrived at. But ultimately, the court can really only return it back to the Congress to sort out their rules. So you could get into a rabbit hole of parliamentary procedure that's very hard to unscramble uh, because the, the Congress is you know, a co-equal branch. And for the reasons you said, right, it's the encroachment of one branch onto another is not is sort of not the way the system works. So the first question becomes who has the standing to sue and get to the Supreme Court. Then there could be an issue of non-justiciability that it's a political question and a court would refrain from getting involved. But I want to introduce another wrinkle, which is that if the electoral college locks up, the vote goes to the house. If for the president, it, and that's state by state, as you described before, delegations, right? 50 votes. If that locks up, the Senate selects the vice president, if it can, 
if they succeed, the, the vice president they select becomes the acting president until the larger controversy can be resolved. If the Senate cannot pick a vice president and Congress is unable to resolve, it's possible that the Speaker of the House becomes the acting president until the bigger issue can be resolved. And that's the way that some news reports have said Nancy Pelosi becomes the next president of the United States. Um, it's a possible scenario that is contemplated in the Succession Act of whatever, 1947. But I think one of the things that's important Mary's there is, is, is the, speak, the Succession Act, the Presidential Succession Act, only applies so long as the controversy is being resolved. It, it's a temporary post. So it's an acting position, acting position, but yeah. It, I want to go I, back to the yeah. litigation point for just to make one other point that even though, you know, two, two points, I guess. One, you know, the election doesn't ever get handed to the Supreme Court to decide, right? Specific issues, if they make their way there, and I think there are a lot of barriers to that, are the issues that get decided and things get resolved. You know, the, 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 of impact of Bush v. Gore was it ended up deciding the election, but it wasn't because the justices actually, you know, made a decision between candidates. And as I think Mark point, pointed out, Gore then chose not to continue to, um, you know, challenge uh, that result and, and what happened when this went back to the, to Florida for the, to cut off the recount. There were pl plenty of more steps that could have been litigated and were not. The other point is that um, some of these questions we're talking about are questions of state law, right? So if the issue is whether the governor filed state law in order to uh, be entitled to that tie-breaking, you know, that would be a question that even if a case was brought in federal court, federal courts should defer to state courts for matters of state law. And so I think as with most election litigation, even that we're seeing already pre-election, these are starting out in state courts, going up through the state Supreme Court and sometimes jumping from there to the Supreme Court. But I think a federal court would be very likely to say, this issue of state law, I need to send over to the state court. And so then we also start to get into a timing issue, right? Because even though um, they would expedite all these briefings, we're talking about a lot of levels uh, to go through. And so, and even then, I think there are serious justiciability issues that, you know, in Bush v. Gore, you know, at least enough justices said that they would intervene in this and issue a decision, but there are plenty of, you know, justices on the other side, and, and it was a different court at that time, and there certainly are plenty of, you know, scholars that would argue that these issues really shouldn't even be justiciable. They are political questions. The, con the Constitution gives the states certain authority, and it gives the, the Congress certain authority. So I think there's just a lot, you know, I think many people and uh, including journalists seem to think this is likely to end up in the Supreme Court, but I think there's a lot of a uh, lot of wiggle room for other results. And I think the point that many of you have made is important that during all of this, right, during any litigation, it's not like the world's going to be standing still, right? You're going to have, you know, the incumbent saying things and tweeting things. You're going to have you know, social media, cable news in a constant swirl, you will likely have demonstrations on the streets. Some of those de demonstrations could involve armed individuals and acts of violence. And so this, this is what would be happening in the courts and, and Congress, I think have to be paying attention to that um, and, you know, protect our democracy and not, you know, do things that would, would you know, foster dissension and unrest and, and, and civil, you know, disorder. So I think it's important to keep in mind all of those factors that would be happening during any litigation. I, I think that's a really important point, Mary, that, that the, the, there are constitutional issues that do not create a constitutional crisis. That, and Bush v. Gore is an example. The U.S. Supreme Court could step in and say, state, you must do X, Y, or Z in order to have your votes counted. And uh, you, you have to have due process, you have to have equal protection, and a uh, counting board in Miami-Dade County, you are not allowed to continue to count your votes because that would be unconstitutional, therefore the count stands where it stands. And, and so there's no constitutional crisis if the U.S. Supreme Court orders state officials to do things. And I think, Senator Hart, that's sort of the point you were making, which is that 
um, the courts would step in before it got to the level of Congress versus the Supreme Court in you know Godzilla versus the smog monster final final battle. Um, so, so so those would come up. I I guess um, I do wonder. I, I have sort of one last question. Maybe this the hypothetical is already stretched too thin. But if there was this kind of political battle, uh, let's say uh, the the votes. Were, were, were still undecided when, when the Senate and the House counted them and it either got kicked to the House of Representatives or it was just stalled there. Would there be any kind of political maneuvering, any kind of political deal making to elect a president in, in Congress? The, the example, of course, is in 1876, Tilden and Hayes, they're deadlocked about how to count the votes. And the deal that was made is that we will remove uh, uh, northern federal troops from the south and, and eliminate reconstruction if we get Hayes as our president and deal done, reconstruction ends. I mean, that was a, that was a, um, a, 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 a bad bargain in a lot of ways, um, and to say the least. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of bargaining that might go on in a political climate if Congress was deadlocked in this kind of constitutional crisis. Senator? It would have to survive um, the spotlight of public disclosure. It, it, no deal like that in um, a closed door room, a back, back door room. Uh, cigars or no cigars. It, if there's going to be a deal, it's going to have to be laid on the table and survive public opinion. And I can't imagine one that would do that. What do you think the effect of the, the polarizing media would be on that? The so-called partisan media? Yes. Well, whip up their own audience, uh, which is standard for the case. Uh, I think much more importantly, despite what the president believes, the mainstream media and the serious editorial boards of those media, including not just New York Times, but Wall Street Journal and so forth, um, would have to weigh in on this. And I, I'd have to believe serious journalists <laughs> You can, you can form your own opinion as to who qualifies, um, would, would take this, writing this opinion very, very seriously. I, I can't, I'll have to process your question, but um, <laughs> for, for, to, to rise to the level of the Hayes Tilden, the deal would have to be, okay, you reelect our president and we'll go overboard on climate change. We'll jump on board. You can have anything you want to, to save the climate, you know, but that's, that's dream world kind of stuff. Yeah, it is. And, but, and I think that it, we are in a different era where there's so much more transparency and your, your allusion to the smoke-filled rooms almost made that possible back then, but it wouldn't be possible now. I think that's your point. Yeah. Well, and but I think this point is so important. It has to be underscored. Transparency, it goes to legitimacy and responsibility. These are core principles of conduct that undergird our constitutional system. Our, our, our rule of law constitutional system is not about mechanistic procedures. There are mechanistic procedures, but it doesn't work unless the, unless the actors involved behave in good faith, responsibly, and, and also transparently. In the case of even Tilden v. Hayes, there was a commission of eminent persons that, that actually looked at the structure of the deal, and it involved Supreme, sitting Supreme Court justices. It was like the Warren Commission later, a century later, on a, obviously on a different issue. But we have a precedent for commissions to review bargains of this nature. Um, so, but I just want to underscore the example of Gore and Bush in 2000, I think is one that should inspire confidence in the American system. 
both candidates acted with a high degree of states, statesmanlike responsibility, and particularly Gore for stepping away from it when he could have contested it and plunged us into a deeper constitutional crisis. And he had good arguments for doing so, by the way. That's what I think as citizens we must expect of our elected officials. Th this should be a moment when America rises to a level of civic responsibility collectively. It's a test of our national character in that sense. You, you've got my vote. Um, <laughs> Mary, anything you want to add to that? Nope, I'm good with where, we've, where we're leaving this. Well, and I, I, I hope that provides our, our uh, journalists list, listening to this webinar with some context about how the electoral system works. It's, there's some technical things, and I, I like the overall observation that it becomes increasingly political as, as it gets further along the line. Let's, let's take those, those um, hypothetical problems and look at some of the steps in the election process to see where they might arise. And, uh, you know, there's everything from misinformation to cyber attacks to mail-in ballot fraud. There's a long list. But let me start this way. I'd like to go around the panel and ask everybody what you're, what you're most worried about with this election in terms of um, the integrity of the election. And, and Senator Hart, let me start with you. What, what are you most worried about in terms of the integrity of the election? Um, you're running the show, but I do note there's a question or two in the queue. From yes, I, I actually just got a, a message from our, mo our, our, our technical moderator that there weren't any questions and I was supposed to encourage people to ask more <laughs> questions. So, so I hereby encourage people to uh, ask questions and it looks like we'll get some coming in. So um, let, me, let me digest those uh, while, while you're uh, telling me what you're most worried about. Well, let me begin by um, responding to the, the obverse of your question. What gives me the greatest encouragement right now is the vast early voting turnout. I mean, this is huge. And it, it's so far, it's been, to my knowledge, uh, without conflict, Very, um, very well done, very well behaved. And it shows that there are in fact, an enormous number of Americans who care. So that gives me great courage and, and, and hope for how this is gonna turn out. Uh, there are people in high places who've been not very subtly encouraging chaos we have not seen that chaos yet. And you're not gonna hear much about throwing early ballots out the way we heard a while back because there are just too damn many of them. So this is an affirmation of democracy. What I worry about, violence, violence, uh, malicious, so-called malicious showing up, uh, working the the voter lines on, on election day, challenging people's credentials, uh, then you've got problems. And that's being encouraged all over the place. And it could cause not only violence, but uh, dangerous situations. Thank you, Senator, for the, for the reminder that our democracy seems to be uh, working and working quite well with the early voting. I, I, I agree, that is, it is heartening. Uh, I'll come back to this question that we do have, uh, but let me get everybody's take first on, on what are you most worried about? Um, Mark, what are you most worried about? Well, I, I can't, I think uh, Senator Hart just put it so well. Uh, I, I think the thing all of us fear the most is any, any type of violence. Um, you know, it's one thing if, if things get deadlocked because of litigation, um, that, that could lead to quite a bit of chaos as we just spelled out in your scenario. Uh, violence, I think, is, is what we all must work hard to avoid. Um, and let's face it, this has been a year of great stress uh, and confrontations. And so uh, there is a feeling of, uh, you know, apprehension out there. And, and we just need people to stay cool. Uh, and that even goes, by the way, the, this idea of staying cool, being patient, even goes to the very basic issue of counting the vote. 
you know, wait for the vote to get counted. We want a full count of the vote. That's the American thing to do. Let every eligible voter vote, let every vote get counted, and let the count be respected. Those principles, I call them American as apple pie. Anything that disrupts that is what I fear most. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mary, what, what are you most worried about? Well, I have the same concerns and they'll be fueled by uh, a continued, you know, foreign influence disinformation campaign, continued foreign efforts to undermine confidence in the validity of the results uh, and to sow discord because as I think most journalists realize, the ability to actually hack into our election systems is, 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 is very low because you know, we have, it's such a diverse election system with every state having their own systems and county by county having their own. And so it's very difficult to make any serious inroads into changing the results by, by foreign uh, influence. But the ability to influence people's minds and what they're thinking in the aftermath of the election, particularly if President Trump is stoking uh, disinformation as opposed to calming it down is the type of um, atmosphere that is conducive to demonstrations. And even though um, if we think about the demonstrations of this past summer that have been overwhelmingly peaceful, it only takes a few acts of violence to then get literally go viral on social media and go viral on cable news. And, you know, an observer, I was doing an interview with the Tokyo uh, TV station the other day, I said, people in Tokyo probably think the entire country here is just like on fire with violence at the, at the demonstrations, because that's what gets played over and over and over again. And so, and that of course creates that, you know, copycat mentality. So I think it's, you know, I just came into this webinar from a press conference with an attorney general, a mayor, a police chief, uh, a sheriff, all talking about how they're preparing, they're, they're unified in preparing, you know, not only to protect against voter intimidation that might occur uh, through armed groups, but also to prepare for that post-election period. And um, I, I, I just wanna reiterate three points that I've been making everywhere I go when people uh, are understandably concerned about particularly armed groups of individuals. They might call themselves militias, they might call themselves civil guard units, they might say they're there to protect property or protect against an election fraud, they might actually say they're out to oppose what they see as the tyranny of the government, but they're unlawful regardless. They are not authorized by federal or state law. Well-regulated militia has meant ever since even before the founding, regulated by the state, not by self-imposed private individuals. They're not protected by the Second Amendment. The Supreme Court's been clear, as, clear about that as far back as 1886, making clear that um, the Second Amendment does not protect paramilitary organizations and thinking it without question, the state must be able to uh, prohibit these. Um, and they reaffirmed that in 2008, Justice Scalia uh, reaffirmed that 2008. And finally, all 50 states do prohibit paramilitary organizations. Their constitution allows the only militias that are lawful are the state militias. So those are the National Guards and the state militias. And uh, many also contain criminal statutes that prohibit this. So this is a not very well known because unfortunately our state, our, our governments over decades have sort of ignored the rise of these private militias. But in the last couple of years and particularly this year, we've seen how dangerous they can be. And so I think uh, correcting the record on the second amendment um, and g empowering the community, including voters and, and community members to realize this is not protected. We don't have to tolerate this. I think it can be very empowering. And the vast, vast, vast majority of Americans do not want to see us be a failed democracy. They don't want to see violence in the street. They want to be able to choose their next president based on ideas and policies and not intimidation and, and you know open warfare on the street. So I think that's what every leader across the country really needs to come you know, come out every respected person and, and be strong on. I want to come back to violence. That's, that's very well said, Mary, uh, and reassuring that we don't have to tolerate violence. Um, I, I, we do have a couple of questions that I want to uh, get answered and then come back to this issue of violence and militias and the Second Amendment. I think those, those are on everybody's mind right now. But um, let's start with uh, uh, 
sort of a, a specific question it comes from a reporter WHO TV in Dayton. And he asks, uh, I think he's asking you, Mark, that if it's tied 269 to 269 in the Electoral College, uh, and the, can, can you lay out the steps in order that would be taken to decide the winner? Yeah, thank you. If I may just start by jumping to what Mary said that in all of those scenarios of potential violence, it will be a big test of governors and of the president of the United States and the executive branch, how, how they respond to those situations on the ground. So that will be a test of the national character as well. Uh, if you know emergency powers are invoked, we could get into all kinds of uh, troubling uh, variations on the scenario. And we can talk about that later if there's interest. Um, on this question, I think I tried to lay out a basic understanding of how this would go. So. If the, if the result of the Electoral Count Act period is that the Electoral College is tied or deadlocked by January 6th, let's say, or the night of January 5th, you go to the House for a vote on the presidency state by state, where major, it's a question of who co controls the majority of the entire delegation of the state. And we talked about the break, the current party breakdown, but it's the future house, which we don't, we obviously don't know right now what exactly that might be. It may be unchanged, but it could flip. If the house fails to give us a POTUS, then it goes to the Senate to pick the vice president. If they manage to pick a vice president, that person becomes the acting president until such time as the presidential dispute can be resolved. If the Senate fails to pick a vice, an acting vice president, an acting president, uh, then, uh, and, and I think it probably is unlikely to be able to because of the quorum rules, a super majority is required in the Senate for that decision. Then the Speaker of the House could become the acting president on January 20th, at noon, January 20th. So that's the basic structure. And I'm sure you can get in there and come up with all kinds of challenges, parliamentary, legal, and you know, constitutional, but that's the basic mechanism. Very good. Um, I hope that answers uh, WHO's question. Um, I have another, yeah, yeah, Mary, go ahead. I'm so sorry, and I am very much apologize for this, but I am um, I am going to have to depart the webinar now to get on another uh, event, and I'm sorry if I mistake it, if I made a mistake in the timing. It's one of those days, and I really appreciate the opportunity to address these questions with all of these great uh, folks on this panel. Well, it's been it's been great to have you here. I, I I'm going to miss you for the next question because I was going to ask about the balance between uh, the First Amendment right to uh, peacefully assemble and the uh, laws against malicious. Um, do you, well, you, you want to try that? Look at what I've read about that or right. what I've written about that. So there, okay. thanks. Okay, so we'll much. Do. Thank you very much, Mary. So well, let, let me put that uh, out for general consumption. Uh, violence is a concern, but but uh, here, here come the supporters on either side, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protesters or the Proud Boys or whatever group. And they say, we have the right to peacefully assemble uh, under the First Amendment and express our views. And in many states, we have the right to openly carry firearms. There's open carry laws. So why shouldn't we be able to express ourselves uh, on election day? We'll, we'll stay back the 200 yards or whatever the number is that the, the local law requires us to, to stay away from the polls, but we want to express ourselves on voting day more than any other day. Well, why shouldn't we be able to um, uh, exercise our First Amendment rights on voting day? Well, the, the law enforce, political and law enforcement leadership of, of that state will have to make a decision whether a, an election, what constitutes intimidation? And if Somebody is pro is marching up and down the street with weapons, 200 feet or 200 yards from a polling place. Uh, a a governor, a mayor, or a chief of police can very reasonably 
decide that that is an intimidation of voters and the Proud Boys or whomever um, can sue them in court, seek an injunction, uh, enabling them to get a judge to say, yes, you can march up and down. I, I, I think that would be very doubtful, but stranger things have happened. And, but, but it, how far is it from that group marching up and down close to a polling place and then going on to the state house and trying to kidnap the governor. Yeah, and it, it's scary. And we've, we've already had violence uh, break out, I think in San Francisco and New York City, uh, there was a report of 11 arrests. I talked to one attorney general who was trying to help local law enforcement make a distinction between open carry laws. They're, they're the, people have a right to carry weapons openly and the crime of brandishing a weapon. Um, because if you're brandishing a weapon to try and threaten somebody, that's illegal. That's not just carrying it, that's trying to intimidate. Um, so I, I guess those are gonna have to be sorted out at a kind of micro case by case, state by state level. Um, and, and hopefully the, the police and the rule of law will play the predominant role Mark, Mark, do you have any thoughts on 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 First Amendment versus uh, threatened? No, I, I agree with the way the way both you and, and Senator Hart have laid it out. I mean, of course, the First Amendment rights of, of speech and assembly have to be pr protected. Peaceful protest, it's all legitimate. But the First Amendment doesn't give you the right to go and disrupt uh, civic activities that uh, you know under our system. You can't just walk into a, a jury, for example, and and block the court system. You, and you you can't you you shouldn't be allowed to disrupt elections either. You're, that's that that's also against the law, state and federal. So, um, those laws should be enforced. Um, but but that should not prevent the legitimate exercise of free speech and free assembly. Um, you, but you know you're not under, allowed to undermine other lawful activities. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a tricky balance because in the case I heard reported, there was um, uh, was it Hasidic Jews in favor of Trump, and they were driving through New York City, and there were some anti-Trump protesters that didn't like that. I, that was a, the basic scenario. But um, uh, I mean, I, again, it's you, you want to respect people's right to free speech if they want to. Uh, lawfully drive down the street for claiming their views, they shouldn't be attacked by anyone. Yeah, I mean, state by state, there are there are limits on so-called electioneering close to uh, polling places. And, and those relate to printed words, sounds and the like, and, and, and those should be enforced. I mean, they're there for a reason. Um, they're there to allow an orderly process. What if we um, take this, uh, and I think Mary pointed out that, that there is, it is against the law to form a militia, uh, to, a, a private militia, and it is against the law to threaten people with firearms. And neither the right to bear arms or the right to maintain a militia protect uh, that kind of voter intimidation. And I think that's important. Well, what, what if this goes up another notch? What if the violence breaks out in a battleground state, let's say Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, to the point where it really does sort of uh, scare people away from showing up at the polls. Um, are there any sort of emergency powers that governors or national officials have? Mark, I know you've written about emergency powers. What can you share with us? Well, and Senator Hart is probably one of our, the nation's foremost expert on, on emergency and special powers. Um, so I hope, I defer to him to start yeah. if you like it. You wanna go Please. ahead, Gary, you're, you're the guru. Well, the, the special, emergency powers issue was raised last spring um, visibly for, I think, the first time by uh, scholars at the New York University Law School, so-called Brennan Center for Justice. And the argument is that the president has secret, there are presidential emergency powers, uh, action documents that nobody knows about. And the more one looks into this, uh, the more 
disturbing it becomes because there are people who have to know whether or not these powers exist and they're, we're pretty clear they, they do exist, but simply will not even confirm that those powers exist. Now, if, if every president were George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, I think we'd be less concerned. But I don't, need, I don't need to say more. I think the circumstances make the case. Uh, some presidents, if, if we were to be have a nuclear attack from Russia, uh, most of these powers would be needed. But the chances of that are pretty slim. And there is no reason in the world that the people of the United States cannot know what these emergency powers are. So I saw that the voting infrastructure has been declared a essential infrastructure, voting. And so in an emergency, would the president have the authority under one of these emergency powers to take over the voting system as you an essential? Answer, yeah, th those questions can't be answered because we don't know what the powers are. The intimation is that they virtually suspend the constitution. Is there some threat? Is there some threshold of uh, showing that that an emergency, a true emergency, exists, or have these powers already been invoked and never re retracted? This president has invoked national emergencies seven times already in this administration. All that is required for these powers to be used is a declaration of national emergency, and it is totally up to the president to decide when that happens. And I know he did it with the with the border wall and trying to redirect funding, declaring a national emergency. That would be one example of what you're talking about? Yes. Mark, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, a uh, further gloss on this is um, that there are a lot of known emergency powers that the president enjoys. They are delegated by Congress. So they're, they're probably about I don't know, several score of those, maybe even a hundred different statutes that have emergency provisions, emergency powers provisions. Uh, those are delegated, they're known. There's another basket of what uh, Senator Hart was referring to that are, you might call secret emergency powers that are primarily tied to, we, we believe, to scenarios of what's called continuity of government. L like for cases like a nuclear strike or some act of war, uh, a very extreme situation. How do you ensure continuity of government? Um, so there, there are really two sets of risks here. One is that the known powers could be abused. The other is that there are secret powers or secret interpretations of powers that we just don't even know about. Um, and what's worrying- as soon as somebody exercises a power, it is no longer secret. So I assume that, uh, that, that at that point, the legitimacy of that power could be examined and, and, and uh, yeah. tested. But it, but it becomes a question of timing again, right? Is how quick, who, who would challenge? You challenge in court. But in the case of declaring an emergency, the president is often given wide latitude, you know, 30 days, 60 days, that kind of thing. Uh, before any review is actually called for. This is with the known emergency statutes. Um, it's a lot like the War Powers Resolution where the president can send US military forces without really getting congressional approval for up to 90 days. So timing is an issue because we're talking about an election and we have that calendar that we were talking about during your scenario, right? These deadlines. So the, the issue is if we have unrest and em an emergency is declared, could that shut things down and collaterally impact on the election process? I think there's no question. The president does not enjoy the power either to change the date of the election or, or cancel the election or anything like that. The issue is, could the invocation of emergency powers lead to actions on the ground that interfere with the counting and the, the finalization of the vote count? How concerned are you that the president would do that? Question number one. 
question number two, how extreme would, would uh, activity on the ground need to be in order for, for that to happen? Normally, as an American, uh, I would not be concerned about a president's likelihood of doing anything like that. This year, uh, I'm more worried than ever before, because partly because we're in a pandemic, a once in a century crisis for the nation, but also because frankly, uh, the president of the United States has made statements about his authority and power. He has referred to powers he has that no one knows anything about. His attorney general has referred and I quote, to the illimitable police power of the presidency, illimitable. Now, I thought we, we operated in a system of limited government. I thought that was the whole point uh, of the US Constitution. But the Attorney General refers to the illimitable. That means no checks and balances, not just limitless, but illimitable. There so, would have to be some, some kind of uh, colorable emergency, I assume. Sure. but. Yeah, but but I, I from hypothesis, you, I think you were saying, what if we had, you know, mass scale violence uh, in urban centers or something like that, and you know, you could call out the national guard. You could federal the president could federalize the national guard, declaring an emergency. If the election infrastructure were attacked by foreign actors, the president like could declare an emergency, or something like that. emergency. right? Um, but just to give you a concrete example of a known emergency power that could be subject to abuse by an unscrupulous president, the Communications and Telecoms Acts have provisions to shut down our telecommunication systems in the case of a national emergency. Uh, now, the context in which those were passed was World War II, but the power is there. And the risk is that an unscrupulous actor would invoke such powers and then just say, sue me, right? Go, go take it to court, but see how long it takes to get that resolved by a court. And in cases of national security, courts tend to give the president a lot of deference on national security findings. So again, there's the risk that the, 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 the checks and balances of the system are insufficient to guard against a president who wants to overstep what we have all understood as the legitimate bounds of these powers. Let me, That's the let me raise a question about how something like that could evolve and maybe the, um, the Biden supporters or the, um, the Democratic Party could become an unwitting uh, participant. I mean, to the extent that there have been um, counter protests uh, that have turned violent or um, uh, you know, a combination of, of a lot of people who disagree strongly uh, being, being confronted with each other. Uh, could there be enough violence there for, for some president to declare emergency powers, uh, perhaps combine that? I, I mean, a doomsday scenario would be like where I started, which is suppose you have uh, riots because people are disagreeing and, and, and the, the Democrats seem to be disagreeing strongly. They've taken to the streets. We have cyber attacks on our infrastructure. And then on the internet, which is something we haven't talked a whole lot about, we have you know, a barrage of disinformation. And so are you saying that the president might have the power under those circumstances to say, we have too much chaos in the streets and too much disinformation on the internet. I'm shutting everything down and taking over. I, I'm saying that a president might try to assert such power. I think it, there's a profound question whether that would be a legitimate exercise of power if the real intent were to interfere with an election. Right, and, and it would take so long to sort it all out that, that it would run the clock out. That's the risk. I think it's, it's a remote risk, but given what an unusual year this has been, I think you know, it's possible to think about it. And, and thinking about it is important because I, I, I believe that over the course of the year, the country has approached crisis points a few times. Portland, Seattle, Lafayette Square. Tensions rose very high. Uh, the president and attorney general talked about invoking the Insurrection Act around Lafayette Square. That would have allowed the use of federal forces, including military forces, to put down unrest. But they backed away. They didn't go there. To me, that's encouraging. But it means you have to keep putting the spotlight 
on the risk. There's a deterrent effect in our democracy. This is the importance of the First Amendment, by the way. Is to balance out the, uh, all kinds of species. Yeah, Senator Hart. Civil, uh, <clears throat> it's awkward to say it, but civil unrest can be manufactured from high places and used as an excuse to invoke secret powers, including under worst case scenarios, uh, vote counts and elections themselves. That's the worst case scenario, but it can be done. So we pray it will not be. If somebody uh, whose belief is that he cannot lose or shouldn't lose, uh, sees himself losing, then who knows what could happen. Let me just say finally, <laughs> with regret, uh, family obligations require me to jump off. I did not budget enough time for this, but thank, thanks to you, thanks to Dean Strauss, all involved. Carry on, Mark. Well, thank, thank, thank you very much for uh, joining us, Senator Hart. We very much appreciate your perspective and, and, and good luck with your family. Uh, Mark, I, I do wanna cover one thing before we, before we uh, wrap up. And that is, uh, what do we do about this? How, how, how do we conduct ourselves? What's the role of the press? What can be done to stop the sort of worst case scenario that I started with, which is a constitutional crisis and, and probably could only be propelled if there was some kind of uh, action on the streets that was very extreme. And it might even in, involve somebody trying to invoke emergency powers, whether the governor or the, or the federal government. What, what can we do to avoid that? What can the press do? What can we as citizens do? Great question. I just say, this is a bit like an Agatha Christie novel where the characters start popping <laughs> off. And like, and, and I'm, I'm honored to be the last, but I'm a little worried about what happens to the last one standing. Um, <laughs> you, get well, the, you get the hardest questions. <laughs> well, I, by the way, I also noticed there was another question we overlooked earlier, which was, how concerned are, uh, no, is there a chance, is there any evidence that the president would play the role of a real statesman as Gore or Bush did before? And I think that's an important question. I don't know if I may start with that. Please. Uh, because I, I, think, I think that we have to keep an open mind on this, that I think that will be the supreme test of, of both uh, candidates, President Trump and, and former Vice President Biden. Uh, they have a chance to redeem themselves, as it were, and redeem the nation by their conduct. And I think we should keep open to that. And I, you know, um, and I hope in my comments about emergency powers and the president, I'm not viewed as partisan, but Donald Trump is the president. Uh, if Biden were the president or B Obama were the president, I would have the same concerns about emergency powers. I believe that Congress probably should hold hearings in the next, in next year doing an audit of these powers we've been talking about. It's something our nation goes through periodically, but it's a way to restore the checks and balances of the system. And that's what Senator Hart participated in in the 1970s, a church committee. There were a number of uh, special congressional committees that were assessing powers, emergency powers, secret powers. That was 50 years ago. We've probably reached a juncture in our nation's history where we need to do that again. On the question of, of uh, the media, I think it, it follows from what we said about the First Amendment. I mean, the, the media uh, need to be the, the platform through which we ask critical questions. We uh, play the role of informed citizens. We hold uh, the government to account to be responsible. Um, we must do that as citizens. The media, the fourth estate needs to be doing that in its own right. There are lots of challenges, obviously, in the social media, social media frontier, where we've seen the, the spread of disinformation, extremism, and so forth. There are difficult efforts underway to kind of curb that without chilling free speech, but those are important efforts um, uh, to restore the health of our democratic conversation and dialogue. Um, and then I think the, the issue of patience that we talked about is very important, that the networks uh, 
and citizens voters need to understand that we may not have full election results by the night of November 3rd. We may need to wait a bit because of the delay of counting. And we need that patience uh, collectively. And the media ought to be sending that message. Don't, don't make rash projections because that could actually encourage the type of you know, rogue actions of declaring someone a victor when it's not, when the count is not finished. So, you know, just again, let everyone vote, let every vote count and let the count stand. Very basic American principles. I think we should hold our media to those principles as well. I, I uh, will use this opportunity to put in a plug for Keep Our Republic's uh, website. There's a, good, there's a good article on there about uh, what the media can do. And, and I, I just, if people wanna explore that further, I refer them to, to your website, Keep Our, Keep Our Republic. You. Let, let me uh, raise a sort of a question that ties the beginning and the end here together, and then we can kind of wrap this up. And that is that I, I understand that the media's job is to report things that are interesting and that conflicts are interesting. So that if there's a, a, a riot or a, a somebody has been fooled by misinformation or there's, there's been a cyber attack, those are all conflicts which are interesting. And uh, the media's tendency is to uh, report those and to uh, possibly even uh, over report those, maybe even exaggerate those in the worst case. But those conflicts can lead to very real consequences for our democracy down the road. Um, if just the conflict itself can result in the votes not being counted. I mean, I, I think, think back to Bush versus Gore and the Brooks Brothers riot where the the protest and how it got overreported was a factor in them deciding to stop counting the votes in Miami-Dade County. Um, I think similarly, if there are a lot of riots and conflicts, and that becomes the perception that this election has been hijacked, it can, we can't count the votes because there's too much chaos, and, and the, the press has a role in reporting that chaos, then that would, could have real consequences for whether or not the House and the Senate can even count those votes when the time comes for them to count those votes. I, I think it's, it's also dangerous that the very people who might want to benefit from those conflicts, suppose you don't like the vote, the way the votes are coming out in Wisconsin, so you create a riot in Wisconsin which says Wisconsin votes can't be counted. So the very people who might wanna disqualify results are the same people who might wanna foment the chaos. So maybe the story is that chaos itself, it could be a strategy a strategy for disqualifying votes you don't like, um, rather than the story being there's a lot of chaos, and a lot of violence out there. I, maybe it's back to your point about patience, maybe it's about calm. It's not a very sexy story to say to the press, just, just tell people to remain calm, keep cool, remain calm and carry on. That's not a very sexy story. But, but if well, the chaos is being used to partisan advantage or as a strategy, that itself would be a story and the press shouldn't participate in it. Yeah, I mean, you, you raise great points. You raise complex points. When I said patience, I really meant patience about the vote count. Don't make premature projections, right? Don't, don't, don't facilitate those, don't promote those. The vote should be fully counted. Uh, if there's a doubt about the final count, don't you know, refrain from, from projections is what I would say. Uh, to the mainstream media. And I think a lot of them have taken that on board uh, from, from what I can tell. Um, the other point you bring up is, is a risk factor. And that's what I meant by unscrupulous actors that might try to promote chaos of various kinds precisely in order to uh, scupper the election, to, to make it inconclusive. And I think that goes back indeed to your opening scenario. How could we end up in a disputed and then contingent election? This would be one pathway. Um, uh, but again, again I, I just think, look, we, this is a nation that has had a civil war. So we can't, we can't pretend that social conflict can't rise to the level of actual violence. It has in our own nation's history. Um, I hope we have evolved since then and we can avoid that, that result. We did hold elections during the Civil War, by the way. Uh, so during a time of supreme national crisis, we managed to hold an election, obviously during the World Wars as well. 
Um, so that gives me some confidence that, that we should get through this. But again, I think as citizens, we have to call on our elected officials at the state and federal levels to live up to their official responsibilities, to uphold the constitution faithfully. Um, that's what the oath of office is, to faithfully uh, um, uphold the laws. And that should be our, our clarion call as citizens. We're the owners of this democracy. We can't afford to be absentee landlords. Well, I think that's a great, I think that's a great place to end it. Um, you are the final surviving panelist. Uh, therefore, you win the grand prize, or somebody's gonna ask you to marry them, one or the other. I'm not sure which. Um, <laughs> thank but thank, thank you very much for, for uh, continuing, and thank you to all our participants. We very much appreciate uh, you joining us today, and we hope this uh, has helped uh, in deciding how to cover elections and how to participate in them. Marks, thanks very much, and thanks to everybody. And with that, we'll sign off. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.